It is no secret that the pastors appointed to this congregation are persons of incredible talent and leadership. I couldn't believe it <laughs> when I looked up and saw Pastor Will on the drums, having just greeted him in the narthex moments earlier while he held one of his children. So uh, I am incredibly grateful for the ministry of this church, for the pastors I consider to be colleagues, and I want you to know that I've already heard your preference regarding pastoral appointment. You, you don't need to send any more people to me to whisper in my ear. I understood what you wanted the first time I heard it. It is indeed a joy to worship with you today, uh, in part because this is a church where the leadership has been so gracious uh, you have been so accommodating and such a part of who we are in the Florida Conference. It's a joy to be here uh, and to greet David and Phyllis Clark, each in their respective roles in the conference, critical to our ongoing ministry in the days ahead. To my friend Larry Cook, who greeted me last year at Dr. Bob Bouchong's retirement. I already knew Larry had me on the radar, and whenever I came this way, I had a standing invitation from Larry to appreciate the beauty of the Asbury campus. I'm only able to stand here today without fear because I've already been on that tour with Larry. <laughs> and I've received the hot dog invitation at the lake. So you can see I really do know something about this congregation. I also want to thank you, and this is to the office staff and, and to Larry and to really all of you, uh, pastors and others, who uh, so generously share your facility. When I arrived, I learned that our DCOM, our District Committee on Ministry, uh, frequently meets in this location. Our clergy gatherings frequently convene in this location. And so you are not only blessed, with a marvelous facility, but you have been a blessing and continue to be as you share that. And I think it's important when your superintendent comes and can say that for all of you to hear it and to know how deeply we appreciate uh, our shared ministry. Now, it does feel a little like a setup, Pastor Chris, to have been invited on the Sunday when our colleague, Reverend Gaston Warner, is also here speaking about Zoe and Powers because Ann Eppinger, uh, has put the pressure on a little bit and wants the East Central District got to come alongside other local congregations and districts to be a part of this work. So every day in the conference office, I work with Molly McIntyre, who serves as the team lead for missions for the conference, and I hear about it from Molly. Then I have you no know, Ann from over the years, and Ann has called, emailed, and visited by Zoom. And now Gaston is here today. I don't think that's a mistake. I think you're just putting the pressure on. And for such a wonderful ministry, I'm thrilled to know that yours is a church uh, considering uh, this ministry partnership and the good that it does. I want to speak to you for a few moments this morning, and maybe the fact that I've said it feels a little bit like a setup will become apparent based on the scripture passage for the morning. Uh, you have it on the screen. Uh, you may find it in the Gospel of Luke, the 10th chapter, verses 25 through 37. I'll read it quickly, and if you'll cite along uh, as I read. It's from the Message Translation. Just then, a religion scholar stood up with a question to test Jesus. Teacher, what do I need to do to get eternal life? He answered, what's written in God's law? How do you interpret it? He said that you love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and muscle and intelligence, and that you love your neighbor as well as you do yourself. Good answer, said Jesus. Do it and you'll live. Looking for a loophole, he asked, and just how would you define neighbor? Jesus answered by telling a story. There was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the way, he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, beat him up, and went off leaving him half dead. Luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road. But when he saw him, he angled across to the other side. Then a Levite, religious man, showed up. 
he also avoided the injured man. A Samaritan traveling the road came on him. When he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. He gave him first aid, disinfecting and bandaging his wounds. Then he lifted him onto his donkey, led him to an inn, and made him comfortable. In the morning, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take good care of him. If it costs any more, put it on my bill. I'll pay you on my way back. What do you think? Which of the three became a neighbor to the man attacked by the robbers? The one who treated him kindly, the religious scholar responded. Jesus said, Go and do the same. Let's pray. God in heaven, we thank you this morning for the light of your son in the sky and even more for the light of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to bless us in our hearing, bless us in our receiving, and bless us as you send us forth in just a little while into the world to be neighbors, to do what neighbors do, uh, and to do so in the name of love. For these and all things, we give you thanks and praise in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, as we say together, amen. If I could have the first slide and just maybe have us look at that for a moment, it asks a question, are you a good neighbor? Now, you probably have a fairly quick response to that. Uh, this is not about whether or not you take your poop bags when you walk your dog, although I'm sure that's important. I could actually ask people who live near you if you're a good neighbor, and that would provide us with another perspective. But it tends to be the case that often that's what we think about when we consider what it means to be a neighbor. And so the lesson today, referred to often as the parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, is an opportunity for Jesus, yet again, teaching and speaking and having people question him, sometimes for learning and for life, sometimes for a gotcha moment. This question, what's necessary for me to receive the blessings at the end of this life, is a provocative question, to be sure. And we should not be surprised that the writer of the Gospel of Luke, also a physician, really takes pains to provide the illustration that Jesus gave uh, that is akin to a person's health, in this case, physical health healing, because this person has been attacked. Imagine, if you will, what it must have been like traveling along the hot, dusty roads of Palestine in the blazing sun without all of the conveniences to which we have become accustomed. I listened with great interest when a few moments ago Gaston referred to, we'll have air conditioning for you. You know, we in Florida really can't imagine living without it. This time of year, I don't know about you, but it feels like days are really consumed by how many stops do I have to make and how quickly can I move from one air-conditioned venue to the other, from the house to the car, let that cool off from the car to the store or wherever we're going. That was not the case in first century Palestine. And the possibility of being robbed while traveling made the trips dangerous as well as uncomfortable. They had nothing else to compare it to in terms of comfort, but uncomfortable nevertheless. And so the second slide asks this question again, and it adds just the little bit of a postscript at the bottom that I hope you can read. Reasons, great or blind. So that's my addition for our thinking this morning. Are we good neighbors? And if we are or aren't, are the reasons good reasons, or is it that we are blind? Our son is uh, frequently, particularly as a teenager, uh, reminded us that uh, mom, dad, there really are no reasons. Uh, you, you're giving me excuses for not doing what I would like to do, and he would always want us to know that excuses are the nails that built the house of failure. Well, yeah, okay, Nick, so whatever. But anyway, sometimes for us, it is something similar. We don't have reasons, maybe we have excuses. Our travel is very different. I've already alluded to the way in which we navigate the heat in Florida. 
We have paved roads for the most part. We have vehicles. We don't have animals who need new shoes or need to be fed. We, we do have to put gas in our cars or plug them in, so we do have to have a power source. But I mean, it's very different. We rarely would think that it's too hot, too cold, too rainy to make a trip unless there is a storm because travel for us is very different. I can't remember the last time I got in my car thinking, I'm going to take a trip and it might be dangerous. But I do want to share an experience with you that I had just the other day. While visiting some of the new pastors in our increasingly large East Central District, I had an opportunity to drive along the East Coast. Now, I specify that because, as you probably know, our new district actually expands the West Coast of Florida near Homosassa Springs and the East Coast, Merritt Island, Cocoa Beach, think that broad, and down to Vero Beach. It is quite something. As I traveled along the east side, it was a beautiful drive, a road that was parallel with the water, and I passed home after home, million-dollar homes, multi-million-dollar estates. And I began to wonder, uh, as the day grew later, wondered what it meant to be a neighbor when people have such properties and often are sort of cordoned off from each other. This is the more typical definition of a neighbor. I began to wonder what might happen to someone like me driving by myself, uh, taking care of the business to which I'd been appointed in this particular instance, and I thought if I had something as simple as a flat tire or something happened to the engine of my car, if for reasons completely unexpected, I had a situation where I became too ill to drive and had to pull over on the side of the road, what might have been my plight? Would I have been able to count on, to expect, that anyone in any of these homes, you know, sitting far back from the road behind multiple gates, uh, would have tendered to my needs as a neighbor. I also saw quite a few uh, sort of neighborhood or community uh, security vehicles driving around. And the message that I took from that is they actually don't intend people who live in those homes to be concerned about having a Jericho Road experience. Not in travel far from home, but even in walking to their mailboxes or walking their dogs. And I realized that as I looked, I did not see anyone who looked like me unless they were working in the yard. I wondered what I could expect from a neighbor. Third slide. What does it mean to be a neighbor? When we think about neighbors, and when we ask people, who are your neighbors? We often answer the question in terms of proximity. Well, the so-and-sos live across the street. The other folks live two doors down. Now, they have two kids, and one's in college. You know, we can usually give that kind of overview of the people that we consider to be our neighbors. They are often people who are like us. They may live a similar lifestyle. They may look like us. Maybe we have kids around the same age. Maybe we even do similar work. Who is my neighbor? And I can tell you that when the scholar engaged the conversation with Jesus, he didn't receive the answer to that question that he expected. Because Jesus commended the answer he gave first. And like many of us, if we just receive the answer that Jesus gives, if, if we pray, if, if God is speaking to us, if we just receive the response that we receive, we'll be okay. But that is not human nature. So he, like we, decided to push the envelope and decided to ask, now wait just a minute, Jesus, who is my neighbor? The scripture says he was looking for a loophole. Well, I can tell you from my personal experience, again, human nature, and just my own sinfulness, my own struggle, sometimes my own arrogance, my own sense that I know what is best. If you look for a loophole with God, you may end up with a slipknot. 
he received a slipknot with respect to the answer. Every time I think that God is calling me to, to do or to be more than I am at the moment, and if I begin to calculate it, I wonder, well, now, Lord, aren't you satisfied with who I am now? I mean, look what I'm doing. I've, I've given my life to ministry. I, I want to help the sick. I, I want to feed the hungry. Lord, surely I am doing all that a person needs to do. We don't set the limits. God calls us for these moments, and Jesus takes the response to this gentleman and turns it inside out and then tells the story of the man who was beaten on the road, the road between Jericho and Jerusalem, a road known for its dangers and its challenges. And sometimes in our day and time, the Jericho road is used figuratively to express or to describe challenges or problems we may have in our personal lives. So it may not be actually about travel, but it may be about the journey that we have, a difficult marriage, a, a child that is incorrigible, uh, things aren't going well at work. We will often say that person is experiencing their Jericho Road experience. Who is? my neighbor, looking for a loophole, receiving a slipknot, not the expected answer. Next slide. So is the question a question about my needs? You heard me describe very briefly my experience in traveling through beautiful neighborhoods the other day. They were not neighborhoods in which I live, but they may be like neighborhoods in which you live, which is all well and good. But I immediately thought, hmm, will I be okay? Will I be safe? If I have a need while I'm driving through this neighborhood, what will I do? Will it be safe for me to get out of the car? Am I safe for staying in the car? We have all asked these questions depending on our travel experiences. And if I get out of my car, is it safe to walk up the road or up the driveway to ask for help? Or will my need be misconstrued? And will I find myself in greater harm or danger than if I stayed in my car? What about me, Lord? What about my needs? Often when we think of being neighborly, we want to know what's in it for me. So, next slide. Is the question really about a concern for others? Might be the same questions, but now we're going to flip the script and really ask, is the question about what it means for me to be a neighbor? Not now thinking just about myself, but thinking about what others need, what the world needs. The presentation about Zoe is all about what it means to be a neighbor and the opportunities that we may have. And Reverend Warner said, some people will never go to the countries they may support. But we can still be neighbors. Rather than practicing engagement with a man who may have been different, whatever different may mean, a priest followed by a Levite saw the man and crossed to the other side. Pastor Chris, Pastor Will, Pastor Gaston, we, clergy, we saw the man and we crossed the street. And then came a Levite. That'll be the lay leader. That'll be the music director. That'll be the chair of trustees whom I met this morning. Larry Cook, that will be you. All of the people who profess how much we love the Lord, we do anything for Jesus, and yet... When we have the opportunity to minister to Jesus in a time of need. When I was hungry, you fed me, Jesus says. Or we didn't. 
pastor cross the road, a church leader cross the road, but a Samaritan stopped. And this is significant in more ways than we have opportunity to engage this morning. Think largely this group within the Jewish community, uh, ethnic minority group within the Jewish family, differences in theology, animosity, considerable tension, and yet the Samaritan was the person who stopped. The excuses don't hold up. We don't have reasons. I didn't help because I didn't speak the language. I didn't help because I didn't know them. I didn't help because, well, the car looked funny. I didn't help because I didn't think it was a nice neighborhood. I didn't help because they need to go and get a job. I didn't help because I'm busy. <laughs> I didn't help because I don't want to get involved. It is significant that Jesus tells a story where we have this cross-cultural experience of being a neighbor. And he uses this parable to ensure that the listeners understand that all people, regardless of who or how they may be despised by others, regardless of the patterns, regardless of the rhetoric, regardless of the volatility of the descriptions that we hear so often in our daily word, are still all children of God, and they are worth our help. And we can be instruments of God's grace in these moments. Is this a question about my concern for others? We know that very often gender, sexual orientation, race, ability, economics, education, sometimes any reason slash excuse that we can find will do just enough to keep us from being available for that moment where we have an opportunity to make God's love real in the world. And each of us knows groups that are different from who we are or associate with. And, and we're, we're, we're often so caught up in what we've heard that we actually don't want the truth because the truth would shut down the lie and then we have to do something. 1,700 years after Jesus tells this story, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, refers to the same passage in his sermon entitled, On Visiting the Sick. Here's what Wesley said. One great reason why the rich in general have so little sympathy for the poor is because they so seldom visit them. Hence it is that according to the common observation, one part of the world does not know what the other suffers. Many of them do not know because they do not care to know. They keep out of the way of knowing it and then plead their voluntary ignorances an excuse for their hardness of heart. Get that. They plead their voluntary ignorances as an excuse for their hardness of heart. Indeed, sir, said a person of large substance, I am a very compassionate man. But to tell you the truth, I do not know anybody in the world that is in want. Are you kidding me? in England in the 1800s? So Wesley asked, how did this come to pass? Why, he took good care to keep out of their way. And if he fell upon any of them unawares, he passed over on the other side. Friends, how hard are you working to cross over on the other side? How, how many excuses, how, how deep do I have to dig to, to justify what I will not do? Not inclined to do it. 
against human nature. Anyone would have not done the same thing I didn't do. How do you like that double negative view? So here is my own summation for today. Being a neighbor usually involves, this is my experience, just going to run through these quickly, seeing another or other, see, seeing them requires time to become involved, a willingness to be inconvenienced without a guaranteed outcome, willingness to make another person's need our priority, money and or other resources, a change of course means, meaning changing our plans, a willingness to learn more about a person and or their situation than we may have thought possible, and the possibility of having our lives impacted in the immediacy of the moment and in the future. Our ministry and support of Residing Hope is the support of children where we can be at their doorstep in an hour. The opportunity to help children in Rwanda is a journey that would take us by plane or boat a day in order to arrive. These are the investments in a generation whose full span of lives many of us would never see. And yet, being the kind of neighbor that God calls us to be means being the investment in neighbors whose names we don't know, and if we knew them, we couldn't pronounce them, whose food we do not customarily eat, whose customs we don't understand, and who are as much God's children as each and every one of us sitting in this well-appointed sanctuary. Next slide jump to this. Good deeds or great love. That's really what it's all about. We understand neighbors, neighborliness in a very specific way, especially in the United States. It is about proximity. It is about similarity. It is about maybe how we're connected to people. Our kids went to school together. John Wesley also believed that there were ways in which people were connected. It wasn't about competition. It wasn't about who had more or less than someone else. Earlier this year when the Super Bowl was played and Kansas City Chiefs won, people followed both the game and the relationship of Travis Kelsey and superstar music icon Taylor Swift like they were neighbors. Most people in the United States, 330 million people watch the Super Bowl. Most of us don't know one professional football player, but we're all into it. Got the names, got the stats. And yet, people in our own communities, or people who are affected differently. So here's just an important tidbit of information. It's small, but it is life altering information. The power for the lighting of Allegiant Stadium where the Super Bowl was played is located on a Native American reservation. That lighting powered the stadium where the game was played and as far away as some places in California. The people who live on the reservation don't benefit from that resource. U.S. Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm said, and so we see the tribes as total partners and friends, obviously, and we want to be able to make sure we see them. And the only way you see people is if you come and visit their homes and visit their nations, visit their lands. This was from a radio interview. You may have known that fact 
I acknowledge I did not. We're all over a game that brings in millions of dollars, highlights people we don't know, and no one who hears this information says, what I need to do is go to this Native American reservation, or I need to lobby and be an advocate for their access to energy. That's what it means to be a neighbor. We don't know, this is John Wesley now, this is not Sharon Austin saying this, but I agree with it, because we do not care to know. And our scripture lesson for the morning are two examples of people who didn't risk getting close enough to know and to be helpful. So selfishness, fear, impressionability, ignorance, whatever the reason, but at times something blocks our ability to be the neighbor that we are called to be as we grow as disciples of Christ. I want to get this in. I know our time is short. Bishop Berlin has called each clergy person to spend time in retreat this summer and develop a teaching or preaching series that is Wesleyan rooted. Wesleyan rooted, not something we got off TV, not what a mega pastor is doing someplace else in another denomination with trying to get us money to buy an airplane and so forth and so forth. Wesleyan rooted. And part of our tradition is the social principles, and that is one reason why I thank Pastor Chris for sharing with you that I also serve as the director of justice ministries for our conference, in addition to serving as your district superintendent. Because the principles are not about how can we make political statements that 50% of the people may or may not agree with. It is all about the relationships we have with one another and the impact of what it means to be a neighbor or not be a neighbor. John Wesley meant something very different by being a neighbor than Robert Frost meant in his poem, Mending Wall. And Jesus means something different when we are called to be neighbors. Wesley pushed against child labor, slavery, economics, and ethics, his work on aid to the poor, prison reform, and education. And those were just some of the realities of, in England in the 1700s. And we still run the risk of not learning those lessons or serving as people who learn those lessons. And so there are layers to culture and what God has and means and has done for the world. God has done for each and every person. God's love is meted out lavishly and unequivocally on every single person, even if they are people or people groups that we don't consider to be our neighbors. Well, I'll close by sharing a story with you or I'm getting toward closing by sharing a story with you. About 20 years ago, a pastor new in the area visited a church. He came on a number of Sundays, and he could have a pew to himself. It was almost as if the people got together and decided how far away they would sit from him. After a time, his family joined him. His wife came, worshiped with him, the children went to Sunday school, and they experienced a standoffishness. Finally, the children told their parents they could no longer continue to attend this particular church. You would find it difficult to believe that they had this experience in a church. I mean, for crying out loud, if we can't get it right in the church, where can we go? You've never heard of such, have you? Except the church of Asbury. It's so easy to think of ourselves as warm and loving and friendly and we welcome anyone until anyone comes knocking on our door, sitting on our pews, 
worshiping the same Lord and entitled to a decent life. And so the end of this story, if we can have the last slide, is provocative for us. And I love the way it ends in Mark's gospel. When Jesus realized how insightful he was, he said, this is the gospel of Mark, you're almost there. We're, we're almost there. We're not bad people. We're almost there. Jesus doesn't call us losers for whom there is no hope. Rather, he confirms the first and second commandment as the greatest, and all the law and prophets hang on these commandments, that we should love the Lord our God and our neighbor as ourselves. So here's the question. Are we all about doing good deeds as we think of being a neighbor? Or are we really called to express great love from which being a good neighbor 